Ravaging Colombian sharks trying to up one ravaging Colombian bears. Yes, it's real, it's stupid, it's brain damaging. Welcome to Kane Shark, the movie we didn't think we need, and after watching it, absolutely no, we didn't need. I'm here to take the brain damage, as always, so you don't have to. Welcome to How to Beat the Ravaging Sharks in Kane Shark. Enjoy. Our movie, and I do use that term loosely, begins at a pier-side amusement park, where a drug dealer is bragging to his client about having stolen some good stuff from a rival kingpin, Gorisco, and he's willing to sell it. Well, he probably should have kept this fact more of a secret, as that boss's right-hand man sneaks up and kidnaps the dealer via a plastic bag over his face and takes him back to the headquarters. Said headquarters is a high-tech research facility where their lab has all the latest in CGI and green screen technology including a shark tank cleverly disguised as just a TV monitor. I know it looks like that, but trust me, it's supposed to be a full-sized aquarium. The staff isn't much better in terms of quality, as we see a highly trained professional researcher doing science so hard that they forget how to wear their PPE properly. Mask goes over the nose. Come on, man. After interrogating the guy to confirm what they already know, as well as finding out where the rival gang's stash is stored, they force the man to climb into the experimental shark tank at gunpoint. He can't bring himself to do it, so they give him some encouragement with a bullet, causing him to fall in. At least I think so. They may have just put a filter over the camera lens. Regardless, this leads to some puppetry that rivals that of Jim Henson Studios as a shark puppet bites at the camera, followed by some screams and the water turning red. I think they're suggesting the man was eaten. After this, we get the opening credits, confirming we are indeed watching the correct movie, even though there is a distinct lack of cane in the shark seen so far. Cut to four weeks earlier, one of the scientists working for the drug lord explains through narration, that they've created a new narcotic using the glands of sharks called HT25. What kinds of sharks specifically? They never say, just sharks. But by selling this compound and by eliminating the competition through force, Gorisco has risen to power. The drug in question has powerful psychedelic properties and is enhanced with nanobot technology to allow for biological enhancements. It's supposed to be safe for human consumption, but something went wrong with their previous test subjects, causing them to mutate. Basically, they created the G-Virus, leading to a spider bat, a man shark, and the deadly crab shark, all rendered in glorious CGI format. To make matters worse, a random explosion happened at the lab, leading to our narrator scientists getting their face scarred and all the creatures escaping into the harbor. Not the direction I expected a movie called Cane Shark to go. We now focus on a man named Neil, who is currently tapped to a hospital bed, as the doctors there keep him in a drug-induced sleep. You'd think they'd use an IV drip for this, designed to do this exact task, instead of having to give him another injection every time he awakes. But you'd also would expect them to secure him with something other than just masking tape, like leather straps or duct tape at least. So I guess this staff is working on a tight budget. This man is an undercover narcotics agent, and we get to see how he ended up here himself those four weeks ago, as gets assigned to infiltrate and take down the infamous Gorisco. He begins this endeavor by getting in a good word with the boss via paying off an underling to talk up his skills, and hopes to get hired on as extra muscle for the Kingpin's group. Unfortunately for this underling though, shortly after the meetup, Manshark appears and quickly rubs some red finger paint on his face, ending his entire career. That night, Neil meets up with Gorisco and his female companion, Persephone, whom the boss serves up to the man on a silver platter. Apparently, he took a quick liking to Neil thanks to the high praises and recommendations the underling gave, God rest him, and wants Persephone to make sure he feels welcomed as one of the family. Which makes what they do together later on a bit weird, but let's not dwell on that. We now move back over to the narrator scientist from before, who doesn't have any given name by the way to make explaining this any less confusing, as he's getting a lift to the airport while carrying a conspicuous briefcase. After the accident at the lab and the escape of the dangerous creatures, he wants out. So he's taking his chemical compound and leaving to expose the whole ordeal to the cops, hoping he can be granted immunity for whistleblowing and to warn the public of the dangerous threats lurking around the water's edge. Unfortunately, the man decided to take an Uber instead of driving himself, and unbeknownst to him, Gorisco already suspected he might turn on them, so he put a hit out on his head. The poor guy doesn't even realize this is the case the entire time he's being driven the wrong direction. 
And even after they stop and steal the secret formula case, the right-hand man, named Jamie by the way, shows up to offer a hand as he knocks the scientist out and stuffs him in the trunk, where they leave him for now, only sparing his life since the Uber driver doesn't want murder added to his rap sheet. Well, I hope he's seen our video on that subject at least. And on that note, let's look over things so far. Starting all the way back with our first victim, the dealer held at gunpoint to climb into the so-called shark tank, he should have at least attempted to escape. Sure, it will be difficult while a firearm is being threatened against us, but between the options given, I'd rather take my chances fighting against a single gunman than I would guaranteeing to become shark bait. As for the detective being held in a hospital bed, they're doing a lousy job of taking care of him. There are no IV drips for his medication as stated, let alone to keep him hydrated or tube feeding to keep him fed. We also discover they are letting him stew in his own filth instead of using catheters, bedpans and so on. Well, slight spoiler alert, but it's revealed soon that the hospital is owned by the drug lord and they're mad at Neil after learning he was an undercover agent that infiltrated them. That could explain the lack of proper care, but also raises the question why keep him alive at all? And if they do need him alive for something, they should do a better job of it, for everyone's sake. For the unnamed scientist, he really should have just driven himself to the airport if possible. That or gotten a trusted friend to do it. Just someone other than a random driver that may just possibly be on a powerful kingpin's payroll. But even if he was naive enough to not realize this until it was too late, he should have realized something was wrong the moment the driver took him in the wrong direction from the airport. At that point, he should have tucked and rolled out of the car, or gotten ready to defend himself, or run the second they stopped the vehicle. Hopefully, he was smart enough to have some sort of contingency plan for something like this, by having a weapon on himself, a tracker on the case, or a way for the information to be sent out remotely should he not be around to enter a password on a device. Just something that would help his odds of survival and exposing the evil organization. We now move our focus over to Neil who is busy getting deep undercover, and by that I mean under the covers with Persephone. After their lovemaking, she offers him some of that sweet HT25, which we learn stands for High Traum, that's German for Shark Dream. An apt name considering that it makes you hallucinate that you're a shark, dominating over wildlife in the deep blue sea. They both take a hit and totally trip out for the next few hours. We now bizarrely cut over to a new character out of nowhere. A woman taking a vacation on an isolated island to rest her mind for a bit as she tries to overcome some past psychosis problems she's been dealing with recently. This woman has no given name as well, inconveniently, so we'll just call her Island Lady. As stated, Island Lady is dealing with some mental health issues and as such she doesn't believe her eyes when she sees a crab shark swimming in the nearby waters. Even though she has a picture of it for proof, she still can only believe it's a delusion caused by her psychosis acting up again, as she doubles down on her medication and ignores it. Hope that doesn't come back to bite her, literally in this case. We now see the scientist again, as he escapes from the trunk of the car, making it look relatively easy, I might add. Must have had a latch on the inside for just such a situation. And thankfully, the scientist was smart enough to place a tracker along with his secret formula in that stolen briefcase, and so uses that to begin hunting it and the goons who stole it. Meanwhile, at Neil's place, he's witnessing accounts of horribly brutal animalistic murders on the news, and reports of local drug dealers being taken out by force vigilante style. But instead of being concerned for the possible dangers or looking into how this relates to the criminal group he's specifically sent to shut down, he's too busy craving another hit of HT25 and wanting to spend another evening with Persephone. This dude really needs to get his priorities straight. Cut back over to the Uber driver and Jamie, who have been assigned to take the briefcase to some operatives waiting on Cat Island. Unfortunately, not that famous one in Japan, but a local small island off the coast. Don't know why they don't just take it back to the main headquarters where the lab is, but I'm sure Gorisco has his reasons. However, when the men go to the meetup location for the boat ride to the island, they find the ship trashed and sinking, with its captain being reduced to nothing but cheap Halloween props and CGI. Guess one of those ravenous lab experiments we keep hearing about, but not seeing much of, must have gotten him. They look for another means of travel, with the scientist hot on their trail. At this point, the scientist is doing more than an actual officer at shutting the criminals down. Case in point, Neil is off spending time with his lover and getting high on drugs once again. This time, however, he has a bad trip and hallucinates killing someone. 
Sure hope that's not a sign of things to come. While he's busy recovering from that experience, Persephone gets called into the lab, where Gorisco tells her that Neil has served his purpose and must be taken care of. Wait, what? The guy's done nothing but get high and spend time with a woman. He even says as much himself, that he hasn't done anything for the gang. What purpose could he have been used for? And why does he have to be removed now all of a sudden? Well, maybe he's been used more than he's realized. We'll come back to that later. For now, the plan is to lure him onto a boat with no cell phones and use him as a means to get Jamie and that Uber driver to Cat Island. Surprise, they haven't just rented another vessel at this point and gotten there already, but maybe they need to keep this trip on the down low to avoid police. Regardless, let's look over things again here. Now, I'm no expert, but I don't think a narcotics agent is actually supposed to be doing narcotics themselves. And why would you want to? Maybe to prove to other gang members that you're on their level. But even with that in mind, if we're hired on as muscle, we could use that as a reason to not take drugs that will mess with our performance physically and mentally. And as an undercover agent, we'd absolutely want a clear head to keep our story straight and not get our cover blown. And of course, to be ready for any fight or flight situations that could come up at a moment's notice if something does go wrong with our operation. And all of this goes double when the narcotic in question is new and experimental. As for that scientist, I know tracking that case down is important, but he's lucky to have escaped with his life. He should take the opportunity given to him now that he's left alone and finally go to the police. He should still have enough information and evidence to expose the operation and gain immunity, and can leave it to the professionals to track the formula case down. Going after it is risky, and what is he supposed to even accomplish once he finds them without any sort of weapon help or plan? Speaking of plans, I'm not sure what Gorisco's even is at this point. But he has stated that the missing test subjects have been taken care of. Yet, we see that is clearly a lie, as Crab Shark at the very least is still at large. He really should have had a backup emergency plan for if the creatures got loose. Some sort of kill switch that could have stopped the creatures remotely to prevent this exact kind of disaster from happening. Now what that something is depends on the finances and technology available to him and his men. But if he is as big of a kingpin as they make him out to be and his scientists can make a mutation serum, I'm sure he could have afforded tracker chips, shock collars, or even remote explosive devices to be implanted in the beast to stop them escaping or harming the wrong targets. But if he did, we wouldn't have this movie to show for it, of course. So Persephone goes through with the orders given to her as she takes Neil on a vacation. Didn't know gang members for drug lords got paid time off. And of course, because it's a day off, that's the perfect excuse to not have cell phones. Of course, you'd think, as an undercover agent, Neil would have found a way to sneak some sort of communication device with him. But when has this man ever been good at his job? So Jamie and the Uber goons show up as planned and hijack their boat at gunpoint, forcing Neil to take them to the contact. On their way there, though, Crab Shark reveals that he's in the area. Finally, something somewhat interesting might happen in this movie. The creature rams the boat hard enough that the crooks drop the briefcase into the water. Unwilling to take the dive themselves, they force Neil to go in after it, so he does so reluctantly. After a relatively short amount of time, he miraculously finds the case. Unfortunately for him, he also finds Crab Shark down there and rushes back to the boat. He gets back on board and floors it away as the beast gives chase. They rush to shore and make it to dry land, where they think they're safe. But little do they know, Crab Shark can scuttle out of the water after them. Here's where we should be seeing an epic chase scene full of narrow escapes, maybe an attack or two narrowly missing people, and our main characters cleverly outwitting the monster and the criminal pursuers. But come on, this is Kane Shark. You think they have the budget for that? Instead, we are told they escaped everything off camera and made it back to the boat, while also stealing the briefcase in the process. How exciting! They ride the boat close to shore, just in case they need to flee again in a hurry from another crew station fish attack and head down the waterway for a place to get help. Before they can find any sort of place though, they are indeed attacked again. Can't blame them for being scared. These visual effects are terrifying all right. They escape off camera once again of course, and are now on a small isolated island. They go to the nearest house for help, where we see this is the home of that random island girl dealing with her psychosis that we saw before. They claim to have had a boat accident because I guess telling her about a crab shark and some drug dealers would be too unbelievable and ask her for any help. She tells them that unfortunately, this is the only home on the entire island. 
and that she has no phone to let them borrow before closing the door on them. They're about to leave for the boat again, but it's missing now, either sunken by the beast or stolen by the dealers or their island contacts. Regardless of the reason why, with no way across the water, they decide to investigate the island girl because she was acting a bit strangely. Looking through the window confirms their suspicion, as Gorisco himself is holding the woman hostage, having had a weapon pressed against her while she was answering the door before. Jeez, this woman has been through a lot. Now, I'm not sure if they don't recognize their drug lord boss, as he is wearing a completely different outfit here, so maybe it's supposed to be like a disguise. Or maybe they just plan on betraying him. For Neil, this would make sense, since he is a cop after all. But as for Persephone going along with this, maybe she has fallen for the undercover agent and doesn't care for her crime job anymore. Either way, their current plan now is to have Persephone distract them at the door once more, while Neil sneaks in through the back and catches them off guard. After using a knife to pry open the window, Neil sneaks in the back while Persephone knocks on the door once more, desperately pleading for a bathroom to use. With Corisco's attention on that, Neil presses a hairbrush handle against his back in a bluff to make him drop his weapon, and it works. Pretty clever. So now they have the boss hostage and are calling for backup, making sure to inform them to come by helicopter and absolutely not by boat, leaving out the reason as to why for that in order to not sound crazy. Of course, Island Lady is excited to learn that she is in fact not crazy, and that Crab Shark does exist and can hurt her. Don't think she should be throwing away her pills though, as this revelation doesn't change the fact that they were working or not. Of course, even more importantly, don't take your eyes off of a threat you're holding at gunpoint. Don't know how both of them were distracted long enough for this to work, but thankfully they are able to regain control of the situation, and now have Gorisco tied up to prevent future escape attempts. We now get to see the Uber driver Goon, lost and separated from Jamie on the island, when he's suddenly found and eaten by Crab Shark. Not bad stop motion effects, really. If it was 1933, that is. While waiting for backup, Neil goes back outside to retrieve the briefcase. However, the scientist has somehow made it to the island, despite a crab shark on the loose and guarding it, and he has taken the case for himself now, as that's still his ticket out of the organization. After an off-camera chase, the two return to the house. I guess Neil finally informed the man that he was a cop so he'd stop running. Well, either way, now that they're back, they find the women are tied up, Gorisco is freed, and Jamie is there to help him out. Looks like the thug got here before the cops could. The scientist flees once again, with Jamie giving chase. Of course, this chase is yet again off camera, with Neil informing us through narration that Jamie got the briefcase, but also had a run-in with the creature once more, and that it spit some sort of goop on his face. That goop slowly finished him off, apparently acting as a massively delayed super acid that kicks in with amazing dramatic timing, melting your entire body like one of the deadites from the ending of the original Evil Dead. Actually, that's kind of an insult to that movie and its special effects, which look much better than this film's effects, despite being made back in 1981. So now Gorisco has the briefcase and is hightailing it through the woods, with Neil and the scientist, who's still alive apparently, following close behind. They don't have to give chase for too long, however, as Gorisco runs straight into the crab shark and is quickly eaten alive. Wow, they even just reused the same footage for the Uber driver getting eaten, which explains why his puppet form was holding a briefcase in that scene since it was left over from here. They couldn't even be bothered to remove that. Apparently, the drug lord doesn't sit too well with the creature's stomach, though, as Crab Shark immediately dies, explodes, and melts. Pretty much the same experience eating too much Chipotle will cause you. The scientist is able to recover the formula, and I guess turned it into the police, since the two of them are seen walking back to the island home and waiting for backup to finally arrive. But wait, how did Neil end up in the hospital after all this? Well, it's now revealed that the doctor taking care of him is actually Persephone. I guess she kidnapped him after everything was done. Turns out, she knew he was an undercover cop from day one, which probably wasn't helped by the fact that the idiot uses his real name for his undercover identity, and she was just distracting him from his work. Not only that, but apparently giving him a special dose of HT25 that turns him into a man shark, allowing him to naturally take out some witnesses. Sure, okay movie, if you say so. And that's how the film just ends, alright? Let's get this final review over with already. After having escaped Crab Shark the first time, they shouldn't have returned to the boat. Of course, they're going to run into the creature again. They're returning to its domain. 
And if they are going to use the boat, they should immediately return to where they came from, instead of going further out where they're unsure if anyone can help or not. I'd rather rush to civilization than to cautiously ride around isolated islands with drug dealers looking for me. And speaking of drug dealers giving chase, just give them the briefcase. They're after that, not us as far as we know, so just leave that for them to find and us to escape. Stealing it just puts a target on our backs. Of course, as an undercover cop, I'm sure that's some great evidence to collect. But that also gives away the fact that we're a cop, defeating the purpose of being undercover to begin with. If we are exposing ourselves though and calling for backup, we should tie up our single hostage immediately. Not sure why they wait for something to go wrong before doing this. And tied up or not, never take your eyes off them until help arrives. Speaking of said help, telling them to bring helicopters was smart. But where are those going to land? There isn't exactly a helipad on the roof of Island Girl's place. Also, spare a few seconds to warn them of some kind of threat in the water. Could always say there was something attacking boats without going full crazy sounding by saying a crab shark chased us. Well, in the end, I guess the bad guys sort of won. Unless that scientist could actually have gotten his evidence to the cops, the only one who knew what went down was turned into a foam rubber shark costume. But if he had actually taken his job seriously and followed procedure, and same goes for the science department, I don't think any of this would have happened. Not sure what happened to the other man shark or that bat spider thing we never saw ever again, but the worst part was the blatant false advertising of the title. There was no shark high on drugs, just a man high on sharks. But with the level of quality we got in this film, I'm sure Kane was involved somewhere. To everyone out there, don't do drugs, they can lead to poor decision making. Let me know what you think. Thanks for watching guys, binge another one and peace out.